Welcome back to the Conduct Detrimental Podcast. Great show in store today. A few weeks back, we uh, talked with Ian Gunn and we reviewed our top 10 sports law stories from 2016 and, and all the impact that they had. And today, we're going to do kind of the inverse of that. We're going to look, look ahead and we're going to look at the top sports law stories of 2017. We didn't take the time to rank them or anything. It's, it's just too hard to really know. But we're going to kind of run through... By sport, uh, we have a fantastic guest on today as well. Uh, but before we get to him, Dan Wallach, my co-host, joins us. Dan, how's it going? It's going great, Dan. I'm really looking forward to this episode and uh, having uh, you know the professor join us. Uh, the one thing about sports law in 2017, it's very difficult to predict how the year is going to unfold, just as we've learned in prior years, always expect the unexpected. And I I think your exhaustive list um, that you put out a few weeks ago is going to grow with some, you know, major controversies, uh, some of which are are not really, you know, known or or can't be foreseen until they unfold. I I expect uh, a lot of action out of the NFL, uh, some disciplinary cases. Hopefully we'll have another deflate gate style controversy, but that's the exciting thing about sports law. It just seems to uh, every year, uh, be, you know, introduce more controversies than the year before, because I think a greater amount of attention is paid to the intersection of law and sports. And I'm really excited about, uh, you know, what the year is going to bring. Yeah, absolutely. And let's just get right to it. I want to introduce our guest today. He's a uh, University of Georgia professor in the sports management program over there. I was lucky enough uh, last semester to come in and gave me a tour of the just amazing facility. We saw the pool where the UGA Olympic swimmers train in the whole place. Um, I also got to sit on one of his classes, which was amazing. It was, I don't know what, Professor Baker, what are you, 100 students in your class? Uh, uh, Yeah, when I think we we had some guests, so we usually have about a 70, uh, the undergrad class is about 70. That time we had about 100 in the room, yeah. Yeah, it was packed. I mean, I I teach a class at Charleston Law School, and they, my class is usually like 10 students, so it was a little different environment, but uh, it was great, and there was, you know, it was undergrad students and graduate students, and they were extremely intent. They, you, you could tell that they just loved the class. Um, in addition to teaching, uh, Dr. Professor Thomas Baker is also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Legal Aspects of Sports. Mm-hmm. He's written right. th- three books. He's published 40 scholarly articles. This man has the CV that, you know, took minutes to download on my computer. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, I'm sure one other issue that we'll we'll touch on later today, but he was part of a group that filed an amicus brief in the O'Bannon case. Um, And so that that legacy lives on, and and we'll talk about that today. But uh, Thomas, thank you very much for joining us today. How are you? Honored to be here, long time listener, first time guest. So. <laughs> could, could we? Uh, you have a, a very you know interesting name, Thomas C. Baker the Third. Have you ever considered trademarking TCB three? You know, like RG three, TAB three, and oh, I should, oh. yeah, yeah. So it's Tab three. Um, uh, I probably should, Daniel, because I. Um, I study and research uh, trademarks so much, and, and yet, you know, physician, heal thyself. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll see if there are any squatters on the U.S. Patent and Trademark uh, Office website and uh, let you know whether there's all, all clearance on that name because it's just a great name, Tab 3. It's easy to remember. And, uh, you know, we're excited to have you on today for this journey through 2017 of sports law. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. And so – just to kind of give a little background on, on what, what we're doing today, I wrote an article uh, last week or so. Um, I've been working on it for a month. Uh, but uh, that basically went through almost every sports law case that I knew about that was uh, active, I think 54 of them in total, and kind of gave a little status update on each three or four sentences. Uh, and I organized them by sport. So we're going to kind of run through that. We're not going to do every case because this podcast would be extremely long, but we're going to touch on the ones that we think are interesting and that will most likely be sort of the highlight cases uh, this year. So uh, I think when I was putting together my list, no sport was even close to as litigious as usual as the National Football League. Um, So I think that's probably a good place for us to start as well. 
Gentlemen, was there any uh, particular case that stood out to you? For me, I would say just because I said this area and because I find it interesting, I like the, the two trademark cases um, because I think they're pretty sexy. The first involving the, um, of course, the uh, it, it doesn't even involve the internet. NFL, but involves the uh, potentially the the Redskins in the sense that it's Lee versus Tam, which is being argued before the Supreme Court right now, like as we're talking. And it was brought by this band called the Slants, uh, a band composed of um, Asian Americans who are who were denied trademark protection by the United States uh, Patent and Trademark Office for the use of the word slants because it's, well, it's, it's a, involving a racial slur. Well, that case has reached the Supreme Court now. And the slants are arguing, actually, uh, Tam, the artist, is arguing that uh, he has taken, that that band has taken the uh, r- racial slur and fused it with a new meaning, new expression, kind of taking it in a way to take a negative and turn it into a positive, something that um, adds pride to uh, their culture and, and kind of like repurposing, I guess, the word. And uh, the, the trademark office is like, no, nope, we're going to reject it. And so we're going to see right now whether or not it's possible to reject, you know, whether, they, whether the USPTO has the authority to reject trademarks that are racially disparaging. And uh, it's, it's interesting in this instance because the band here is relying on the First Amendment for the right to use this, this, this uh, derogatory word. And, it's, and why that's interesting is that usually in trademark cases, uh, the First Amendment is used as a shield to protect uh, would-be infringers, you know, uh, people who are, are uh, junior brands that are being accused by senior brands of appropriating uh, the senior brand's mark. Uh, and they rely on the First Amendment as a shield. But in this instance, the slants are actually using the First Amendment as a sword to gain trademark protection. So that's pretty interesting. And the Redskins are waiting in the wings because they're, they're waiting to see if, if the Supreme Court says the USPTO does not have the authority under the First Amendment to, to deny registration of these marks uh, based on the fact that they're disparaging, then, um, then the Redskins will be able to uh, also get trademark protection. Yeah. I mean, the court uh, held oral argument on Wednesday, January 18th. And from the takeaways that I've read on, you know, SCOTUS blog and several of the other uh, uh, reporters that were in attendance, the justices seemed hostile to the trademark offices, uh, you know, position as to the disparaging, you know, trademark issue uh, that if the slants, the slants look like they might be able to, you know, prevail at the Supreme Court. And if that's the case, the Redskins are going to be, uh, you know, on firmer legal standing and it might not even get to the Supreme Court. I think the fourth, Cir- you know, the Fourth Circuit case is on hold pending the outcome of the slants uh, Supreme Court case. So uh, the way things uh, unfolded last week. It looks like the Redskins and, and the Slants, you know, could be on firm legal ground here. Yeah, Daniel. There was one key question that I saw raised by Justice Kennedy, where he said um, he questioned whether the USPTO could could do this in light of the fact that the, they regularly grant copyright protection for uh, racial slurs used in in songs or in other mm-hmm. types of artistic works. I would say that there is a bit of difference between trademark and copyright. Uh, trademark exists as a consumer protection uh, mechanism. It all provides some degree of uh, pro- proprietary protection for, for senior mark holders. But it's mainly about consumer protection, whereas copyright exists to protect um, creativity. So if a musician is using a racial slur in a song or an artist is using something that would normally be deemed obscene in an artistic work, then, you know, there could be some, some expression of First Amendment protection. Where when we're talking about trademark, we're talking about commercial speech that exists to, to, um, for consumers to identify uh, product brands with the marks and names that represent them. 
And in this sense, I, I just don't know if the same amount of creative expression or the, the need to protect the First Amendment, it rises to the same level as it would in copyright as it in, in this instance. So potential situation where the slants actually are able to prevail on the limited ground that they have repurposed this name. They have added new expression to this derogatory word where the Redskins use of their name and their marks is more totemic. It's more symbolic. It's less expressive. But with that said, you know, I mean, it's in this day and age, it's, it's, it's very interesting to me that we're actually still debating the use of a racial slur on a professional sport for a professional sport franchise and its name. You know, I understand that the organization and its fans, you know, I, I don't assign them to be, I don't say that they're racist necessarily by any means, but, you know, I think they look at it as being a historic type thing. This is their team. This is what they, they've always known it by. But, but at the same time, I mean, is there... I mean, we all know that this is a racial slur, and, yep. and 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 I don't know if the federal government should be the one to say, "Hey, Washington Redskins, you know, change your name." But uh, it's it's a heated debate with passion on both sides. Let's just say that. Well, I I went to undergrad at Miami University of Ohio, uh, which was formerly named the Redskins before I attended, and. Uh, they switched a few years before I came, and I'll, I mean, it's certainly on a much smaller scale, and it's other schools have changed as well, but, you know, people were angry for, like, a year or two. I remember when I got there, like, bookstores were, like, proudly selling Red Miami University Redskins gear, but by the time oh. I graduated four years later, I mean, that was pretty much gone. The talk had pretty much faded. Um and we were, we're the Red Hawks. And now we're the Red Hawks. Um, and I personally feel much better about that. Um, but that being said, let's move on to the, the other much more recent trademark dispute. And that's the newly minted L.A. Chargers who have had a, uh, I would say, an IP disaster since they've, uh, <laughs> since they've moved in the various things that they've done. They're, they're, they leaked their logo, which is not really their logo, which looked basically just like the... LA Dodgers yeah. logo with a little lightning bolt on the end. And then they, and the Tampa Bay lightnings logo. Yeah. And, uh, I, I think <laughs> the first time in, in, uh, in, on Twitter history, we've seen professional sports franchises trolling other professional sports franchises. It was, uh, more than a disaster. I think it was just an embarrassment for the organization to have not, yep. um, you know, um, gotten a read on what the, what the reaction might be. But then again, for Dean Spanos, uh, this is probably consistent with, with everything he's done over the last two years. And uh, it's really a sad day for the fans of San Diego and St. Yep. Louis and now Oakland that are going to be losing their franchises uh, over the, you know, because of the greed of NFL owners wanting to be in larger markets to enhance the value of their stadiums. But this is an interesting uh, trademark dispute because it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't prevent the Chargers from using the name L.A. Chargers. It is limited, I think, to the issue of whether they can have uh, you know, that logo on clothing and apparel. Uh, so this is not yeah. a, a, a opposition to the use of the name uh, Los Angeles Chargers. It is limited to L.A. Chargers on gear, apparel, and, and, and other clothing. And, and it's interesting. Thing here about that LA gear. What's what's funny for me is that this case reminded me that LA gear still exists. You know, <laughs> I haven't thought about LA gear since the 1990s. But uh, you know, maybe that was the whole. Maybe that was the whole point. Yeah, I you, actually. You guys don't wear right light up shoes anymore. I, I still have a pair. Well, I mean, those are classics. I guess you know they <laughs> they belong in a museum somewhere. Uh, I I think you're right, Daniel. I think this is a great. Um, case for I, I think it's positioning LA gear to remind everyone hey we're still here and I, I think LA gears actually got an uphill legal battle only on the grounds that you know they're, they're trying to say that uh, this is straight infringement in which case we would have to fall back on consumer confusion as the standard and they're saying that you know if uh, this is allowed to go forward then consumers of LA gear are going to be confused thinking that they are manufacturing uh, gear with the LA Chargers uh, 
uh, for they're, they're manufacturing all the LA Chargers um, products. And honestly, I think that would actually be a big win for LA gear if they were actually confused with the LA Chargers in this way. But um, I mean, LA gear wishes they had that contract. But uh, in reality, I think um, in this instance, showing consumer confusion might be difficult. If it were the LA Dodgers, I think uh, consumer confusion would be a slam dunk. I think that would be a lot clearer case for me. Okay, well, it won't be. Uh, th- this trademark dispute will not be decided anytime soon. This is, uh, uh, I think, it might be just at the opposition phase right now, and then it has to go through, you know, trial, you know, trademark trial and appeals board. So this is a resolution uh, that won't come to pass in 2017. It has all the earmarks of a potential settlement. Um, first yeah. of all, the news value associated with LA Gear having this kind of promotion uh, all across the media because they uh, are now getting the kind of publicity that never they had not not, not achieved for for a long time and I could see see this deal ending up uh, with a payment by the uh, you know chargers to LA Gear maybe maybe some kind of a promotional arrangement where LA Gear becomes you know like the official uh, you know apparel manufacturer or the official shoe of the Chargers there's a deal to be had here and uh, you know when we when we look ahead a year two years after, out, I don't think there's going to be any uh, judgment or or no. um, adjudication of this issue. I think it goes away with with the payment of money or some kind of creative settlement. Yeah, Dave, my prediction is that the LA Chargers are going to withdraw their registration and, and try to register new marks that are are distinctly different from the ones that they held. Well, how do you do that if you, they're still going to use L.A.? It, it, you know, it, the issue isn't the Los Angeles charges. It's the L.A. charges. How do you get around yeah. the word? Oh, the, the use of the word L.A., they're just going to have to be able to come up with some distinctively creative new mark that doesn't resemble L.A. gear. Okay. That's my – That's my. I mean, whether that's possible, uh, I that's, imagine it Yeah, could but that's happen. the symbol. That's the symbol. What about the word? Oh, the, the word L.A.? Uh, LA Gear doesn't own LA. They just yeah. own a distinctive mark that, you know, with that, you know, little swish kind of coming from the bottom up through the top. And and I think the Chargers are going to have to use something that's that's very distinctly different from that mark. Yeah, I, I, I discovered that on uh, you at the USPTO website a few days ago. This, this opposition was filed back in late December, and no wow. one had – Knew, no one knew about it, and then when the Chargers announced their move, as I'm wont to do sometimes, I like searching the databases of the USPTO to see what kind of activity is surrounding that name. And I discovered the opposition, and I tweeted it out, and you know, it just seems like everyone started writing articles about that. So it was a missed opportunity, but I, I think in terms of a major sports law story, it doesn't quite rise to the level because it's more of a uh, uh, an intellectual property financial dispute rather than something that might threaten the use of the name L.A. Chargers. You know, it doesn't rise to the same level as, let's say, the the battle over whether the uh, Las Vegas Golden Knights can keep their name. That goes to the use of the name as a name, not just on on apparel or clothing. Uh, So it's a fun issue, but I think it goes away over time. I agree completely. Yeah. Uh, Let's move along to a case or cases, I should say, that very well could impact the game. And that is uh, the spill-off of the NCAA concussion settlement. This is one for me that I think is going to be particularly interesting moving forward. We're kind of at a turning point right now. Obviously, the uh, concussion settlement is now final. And we're moving into this opt-out cases phase. And and these are, you know, I put a, a list up. I think at the time when I posted my story, there was 57 cases uh, I think a handful of these have since decided that they don't want to be opt-outs and they want to opt into the settlement, so it's shrunk a little bit. But at the end of the day, the NFL is yet to get into discovery uh, in a concussion litigation. Um, and one of these cases, maybe the insurance case, which is now moving into discovery, uh, may be a case that we really find out what the NFL knew. And uh, you know, if any of these cases or all of them together were unclear about how they're going to proceed at the current moment uh, goes to trial, I think that would be just a huge, massive uh, trial where they you know they trot in all the the execs of the NFL, put them on the stand, um, 
and they obviously would have gone through their discovery before then, so they would have all their documents. So I think that's something that could be massive moving forward and a really interesting case to follow. Do you guys think that these cases are, are maybe unlock the truth about concussions in the NFL? I say no, because if I'm the NFL's uh, outside counsel, the words Roger Goodell and under oath should never, ever <laughs> be linked together and uh, the NFL is playing with fire if it continues uh, to battle its insurers over the uh, issue whether the insurer should pay or fund the NFL concussion settlement. This was a fantastic deal uh, for, the, for the NFL. I mean, their, their annual revenues are 10 billion, upwards of 10 billion or more, and their settlement is just a fraction of one year's annual revenues, and they have too much. They have too much downside risk here uh, because of the 57 opt-out cases. I mean, this discovery with the uh, in, in insurers is going to be taking place, uh, you know, from from February uh, into next year with up to 50 depositions. There's just too much for the NFL to risk here, uh, given the potentially, you know, 57 or more other cases that have to go to trial, I see the settling. There's no, no, what, no way I could envision uh, Roger Goodell and Elliot Pellman, you know, who used to, you know, run the NFL's concussion, uh, you know, committee. Uh, there's just n- no way that that seems like a, um, a smart thing for the NFL to do to allow this kind of, I mean, the paper discovery is going to come out. It's the oral testimony under oath that could be particularly damaging to the NFL. And uh, I see a deal being uh, struck. I mean, they're going to have a confidentiality stipulation surrounding these depositions, uh, but it's going to be free discovery for the 57 opt-out cases. And I see that uh, I would predict that uh, the, the, the lawsuit against the insurers will settle at some point before Roger Goodell ever has to give testimony. This is a, a, a disaster waiting to happen. I agree with Daniel a thousand percent. The former litigator in me is like, settle, 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 and do it before discovery really gets churning. Because, like he said, you don't want Goodell to pose under oath. That would be disastrous. He can't even handle a press conference yeah. without <laughs> being scripted. You could be coached in a deposition, but we're talking about some very aggressive, smart uh, plaintiffs, attorneys who've been preparing for this day mm-hmm. for a long time. This is going to be a very hard deposition for Roger Goodell uh, to successfully navigate. And once yep. the cat is out of the bag, I mean, those words are going to stick to him for an eternity. Yeah. Well, my thought is... Yeah, the insurance lawsuit probably settles. They, you know, find a way to split that money one way or the other. But these 57 other cases, right? We've already seen that these players out of thousands are ones that want to take this case to the distance. And you have to think at least one of these players or one of these groups of players, some of them are more than one player, are litigious and, and, and want to do this more on principle rather than money and won't be able to be bought out. And, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the NFL will be able to settle with all of them. But I think at some point, one of at least one of these cases, maybe many of these cases are going to go to trial. And, you know, obviously these NFL execs are relevant witnesses to uh, how the NFL has treated concussions over the years. So I think that while we may not see that type of spectacle this year, I think it's just a matter of time. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how, uh, how how the federal court and state courts hearing these cases treat the issue of preemption under the collective yeah. bargaining agreement, uh, because that never got litigated. One of the reasons um, the, the plaintiff's attorneys in the concussion settlement were motivated to settle was the downside risk that they faced from two particular issues. Um, the um, issue of whether the collective bargaining agreement and federal law preempt this, you know, these state law claims. And then, of course, there's the statute of limitations issue. But the statute of limitations, uh, ha- ha- the decisions in that arena that have been issued in the last year seem to be coming down on the side of the players. I mean, if you've, uh, you know, the, 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 the accrual of the cause of action doesn't begin with the hit, it begins with the onset of the symptoms you know, years later, and I think there have been three or four uh, decisions out of state uh, federal appellate courts that have sided with plaintiffs on that issue. And of course, the NFL's recent, uh, um, 
you know, disclosures and admissions as to the causal link uh, between these concussive hits and the later onset of the, these degenerative diseases, I think, the, uh, I, I think the courts will probably side with the players at least on the causation issue and the statute of limitations issue. The, the bigger question is whether uh, the federal law preempts the you know, state law claims. And in the Canadian Football League, there was a similar lawsuit brought north of the border, and a Canadian court held that uh, you know, uh, the state claims were preempted by their you know, collective bargaining agreement. Am I mis- is, is that an accurate way to kind of like drill down, uh, you know, the issues in the in the opt out cases? Because yeah, I think so. I mean, I think the, I the think big so. one is preemption at this point. I think that's the NFL's big wild card. I think one of that that's obviously massive for them. And you know, I think when we had Paul Anderson on this podcast a few weeks ago, who who is an attorney for some of the opt out plaintiffs, and has been just you know, obviously this has been his sole focus for years. You know, he was uncommittal on that. You know, obviously the players have a stance that it doesn't preempt yep. uh, the claims, but uh, it's certainly an open issue. And if, you know, it's certainly one that the NFL is paying some of the top lawyers in the U.S. to yep. argue. So, um, and, and, and and not every player, though, faces that argument. Um, there's one plaintiff in particular, the New York County Supreme Court, Art DiCarlo, he played uh, in the National Football League in the 1950s and early 1960s before yeah. uh, before there was ever any collective bargaining agreement. And if he can overcome or withstand the NFL's uh, statute of limitations argument, that was uh, that was argued in December. And I expect a decision, uh, you know, any week now from New York State uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Manuel Mendez. That could be the case that provides the vehicle for all this discovery if he could survive that statute of limitations defense. Yeah, but then the discovery maybe is less relevant because we're talking about discovery pre-1955, uh, which yeah, I would imagine there's not that much out there. It's just a lot of mm-hmm. devs, you know, pre-email. Yeah, well, dis- discovery is pre- dis- the, the discovery is pretty broad. I would, you know, if, if if it's not quite a fishing expedition, it's right close to that line. And, yeah. and certainly on the issue of punitive damages, uh, the NFL's uh, position uh, right. going forward from the fifties and sixties might be relevant to DiCarlo's damages claim. Yeah, but. But we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but these are going to be, uh, you know, fascinating issues to watch out in a variety of different state and federal courts. Because you might, you might see different decisions and conflicting decisions emerging because not every case is before Judge Brody. There are the state court cases as well. Right. Uh, well, I think enough on concussions. Did you guys have any other uh, in the NFL category? Um, in the NFL, I'm... I'm I'm always watching the the criminal proceedings like with Aaron Hernandez and and uh with Randall what's going on there and and then we have the the matters involving the domestic violence with Ezekiel Elliott and how that is just dragged out. Yeah. That's something that interests me too. That's one I had because... highlighted as well and it's just you know we got word I think was it Week, week or two weeks ago that the NFL went back to Elliot with a request for new information, which I think yep. it was just an excuse to drag this thing on. That was my take. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely interested to hear the timing of when they announced their decision in that case. Yeah, I, I mean, this is going to be the biggest story, biggest sports law story in the National Football League in 2017. There's no doubt about it. You have the, um, uh, pers- the possible MVP and rookie of the year in the NFL uh, who will likely, I, I mean, it, it has, it has all the signs of a suspension because they would have cleared him already. Right. If, if, you know, g- given all of the information that the NFL had from the city of Aventura uh, public record search uh, from February and then the Columbus, Ohio police department, they have all their records. They right. have the victims the con- cooperating in this the case. victims cooperation. If they're, if, if, if they were going to clear them, it would have happened already. So I see a suspension coming down the pike 
uh, probably pretty quickly after the conclusion of the NFL season. And then you're going to see a court. You could you could see another deflate gate, a court battle over this, you know, arbitration. This this could drag on for many months and be the gift that keeps on giving to sports law because I uh, sports law attorneys and commentators in particular, because this is not going away. I would expect a a suspension of Elliott of some duration uh, to be cleared to give him nothing would send a, a w- w- would invite so much criticism and outrage from women from the media they are almost boxed into a position here where yeah. they have to give them something and daniel i'd like to add to your deflate gate comparison if you don't mind saying that jerry jones he recently had a quote where he was like, you know, we're just trying to make sure I'm paraphrasing. It's something on the lines of I'm just we're just now trying to make sure there's nothing else out there. And it has led a lot of commentators to think that he really thinks that Elliot's gonna walk away from this scot free with with no sanction. And that leads me to believe that if Elliot is punished, and I do think the league is boxed in, just as you said, and um, if Elliot is punished, then we might have an owner that is just as enraged as Kraft was during the Flake Gate. And that could uh, further link these uh, two types of cases in the sense that you would have an owner with the ambition of pushing this and a players association that would probably push it too, especially given how long it's dragged out. We could have another gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Well, Joe should be, if he gets suspended, which I think is still a big if. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion by any means. But Jones should honestly be not mad because they could have suspended him right in the middle of the playoffs. Um, and they probably, the timing of this probably should have been, you know, down the playoff stretch, considering when they had all the information that they needed to make this decision. So. I, I won't feel bad for Jerry Jones at that point. I'll put it that way. I, I agree with you on that too. But then again, you know, uh, the it's league. Jerry let, Jones, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's Jerry Jones and the NFL let Brady play in the Super Bowl following Deflate yeah. Gate. You know, they didn't suspend him then either. So yeah, I, but then I, I, I know the timing was different. Yeah. 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 I mean, look what the NFL is facing if they if they if they. Uh, Exculpate, you know, exculpate him or, or uh, you know, exonerate him from any uh, role in this and, 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 and give him no games. You're talking a succession of Ray Rice, Josh Brown, Ezekiel Elliott, and then, of course, welcome to the NFL, Joe Mixon. This is going to be uh, – uh, uh, it's, going, it's going, to, going to overshadow – so much of what the NFL wants to, uh, you know, uh, highlight about itself in the off season that will be the NFL's off season. No talk about the draft. This is simply going to be another bungle uh, by the NFL, uh, you know, disciplinary apparatus. And you know, I hope it goes to court. I'd like to see uh, Ezekiel Elliott face some kind of discipline and then try to challenge it in court. And maybe, maybe we have a battle brewing uh, eventually in the federal district courts in Texas and the Fifth Circuit, and we could have uh, a different way of evaluating and assessing the scope of the commissioner's disciplinary authority and not simply live with uh, the Second Circuit decision and Eighth Circuit decision at Deflategate and Peterson as the, you know, final, um, the final opinion on the scope of the commissioner's disciplinary authority. So I really hope this gets to litigation because NFL, uh, NFL litigation is the, is the most fun to watch. It really is. It, it is the most fun to watch. I will say this. I think, though, if this does go to litigation, I think the league has a much stronger position than they did even in the flake gate because there is this domestic violence policy that's in place that is a lot more um, mm-hmm. clear than the, you know, uh, governing in the best interests of football you know what i'm saying and so in this instance they do have a something that they can point to and this was violated and and here are the ramifications and we do and and i i will take issue one point i i love the fact that the players association keep bringing actions like this because it gives us things to talk about and it gives me something to write about but then again, you know, the, the litigate everything approach by the NFLPA does undermine uh, the, the entire process of uh, sport art. I think on both the Flake Gate and Peterson is a pushback from the federal circuit saying, hey, you know, you agreed to this process of dispute resolution. And if you don't like it, change it within the CBA. So that's something that I think will also carry into any potential cases is this 
is yeah. is a is a really backlash from the judiciary. Yeah, but they can't. Uh, the the players' association can't be any worse off by litigating. I mean, they they're stuck with the decisional law from Brady and from Peterson, and they're stuck with the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, so that is not something that will be revisited until twenty twenty one. And I think the uh, the litigation route is really the only leverage that the players' association enjoy enjoys. They may have an uphill battle given the benefit of the bargain that they struck and given the case law that now is, you know, sort of the, the law of the case or the law of the issue. Uh, but they have little choice but to keep fighting and hopefully they'll find a friendly or, or, or a, you know, positive outcome in another federal district court because I don't think this issue is, is slam shut forever judicially. You just have to find the right issue, the right case, and more importantly, the right three-judge panel. I mean, the same issue in Deflategate that's before a different three-judge panel could have yielded a different result. And that's the problem with, uh, you know, with litigation sometimes. It's not simply a matter of the merits. It's simply uh, luck of the draw, depending on the, um, the, the, the uh, you know, the viewpoints of three judges out of potentially 20 that you could have drawn. I mean, right. just like just any other case. If, you just need if two it was, of them, actually. You just need two out of the three, well, right? Yeah. Yeah. In, in the flight gate timeout, there was an on bonk request that was denied. So oh, but they, the they, second... they're, they're always – I mean that's, a, that's tough sledding. Once you get past the three-judge panel decision, uh, yielding an on bonk is, is like a lottery ticket. I, 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 I think the Second Circuit is pretty clear. That's, yeah. I, I think if they're going to gain success, it, it won't be within the Second Circuit or the, or the Eighth Circuit. They're going to uh, be able to, to go somewhere that... else. It's got to be the Northern District, Northern District of Texas, or the Fifth Circuit. Yep. So, well, anyway, that's that's definitely yeah. something that's interesting moving forward. Uh, I know we mentioned Joe Mixon. Joe Mixon's actually in his yep. civil lawsuit, sitting for a deposition this week. Um, a civil lawsuit filed by the woman who he struck in the face. Um, we've talked about that case before on this podcast, I believe. Um, and that has an uphill battle, but another just interesting side note, um, sort of wrapping up with the NFL, the only other case out there that I thought is really interesting, um, one that's off the field, but uh, has the dynamics to be just a great, great, interesting case, uh, is the JPP versus ESPN mm-hmm. and Adam Schefter medical records case. Uh-uh. Um, and if you look at that case and you think about you know, one of the cases that blew up last year was the Derrick Rose civil trial. This has a lot of the same elements as far as timing, right? So the case is scheduled for trial at the beginning of August during NFL training camp. Uh, you know, we have the NFL media, or the, excuse me, the New York media market, obviously the NFL brand. So ESPN involved, I mean, there's this huge, huge potential for these major players involved. Um, but the bottom line is, I think, Based on what we've seen from Hulk Hogan and a few other things, I think ESPN's probably and Schefter are probably very scared of this, and you know it'll likely settle before August. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I'm sorry, Tom. Go ahead. Be scared. No, I, that, that's my comment. They should be scared. I believe. I, I agree with you. It, it reminds me very much of Hogan, and in this instance, I think JPP. You know, it, it it's even more damning because it deals with very private medical uh, records that that should be protected. Yeah, but but the JPP case, uh, you know, to take, play devil's advocate here, it lacks one element that was present in the Derrick Rose, Aaron Andrews, and Hulk Hogan cases: uh, sex. I mean, is the peeping Tom case, sexual assault, sex. Uh, those were, were violations of some, the sanctity of somebody's, you know, private affairs in their, you know, in, in their, you know, in, in in their in their house. Private medical records is is potentially uh, uh, an even more serious issue, but the damages suffered by JPP um, are, are, are going to be – it's going to be difficult to establish that there was a significant diminution or loss of reputation because he went on to have a, a terrific year and is going to score uh, a pretty big contract in free agency. I think, though, that the case, if it goes to trial, this is a very strong plaintiff's case because at some, because private medical records are about as sacrosanct – um, as it gets, and the, the 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 big question mark in this case is how do you put a dollar value on it? And uh, from 
Yeah, from the NFL's perspective, I think the downside is, you know, uh, facing a, an Aaron Andrews, Hulk Hogan type of verdict. And, and you know, the last thing that uh, ESPN wants to do is damage the Adam Schefter brand. He is one of their you know, preeminent NFL analysts. And given, given the um, successful year that, that Jason Pierre-Paul had on the field, uh, he's going. He's going to score an eight-figure annual contract. So I think there's room here for a reasonable settlement. He's not going to get a hundred million dollars, uh, you know, in a jury verdict. Uh, I think this is a case that has a value of anywhere between high seven figures and low eight figures. And I think that's a tolerable, pal- palatable number for the NFL to write a check. Otherwise, it deals or it potentially enters into the great unknown of jury verdicts. So I, I think this case is going to settle uh, before the August 7th trial date. I agree. I think when you think about it from a juror's perspective, assuming that liability is established, but you're just thinking about the damages issue and you kind of compare it to Hulk Hogan or Aaron Andrews, you think about putting yourselves in the jury's shoes of assigning the number to the case. And uh, you you think about what happened in Hulk Hogan, especially you think about what happened in Aaron Andrews' case. Those are just horrible. And I, I would imagine that a juror who sat through this trial, like, hearing the intimate details of everything was just mortified by the actions um, and the ultimate damage to the people. Whereas this case, it's like, well, uh, you know, it's a medical record and that's, it's very invasive and bad, but like at the end of the day, we see, yeah. we now see him, he, yeah. he, his hand is what it is. It's was going to come out anyway. So um, okay. it just doesn't seem as like, like it, you mentioned, Dan, something that's going to be a hundred million dollar case. Yeah. The just, reputational harm in this instance is just, it's much it it is drastically smaller than what happened in those other cases daniel's absolutely right so it's gonna be harder to assign some sort of some sort of uh damages to to what he suffered yeah and and really privacy yeah what's really uh signaling a settlement possibility here is the judge has pretty much signaled how she's going to rule. I mean, this is the, 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 the argument that the NFL, or I'm sorry, the argument the ESPN and, and Schefter are raising as a defense is the defense of the First Amendment and is the uh, right of privacy under Florida law give way to the First Amendment. This is largely a legal question, and the judge denied, the, he denied ESPN and Adam Schefter's motion to dismiss uh, several months back, and there was language in her order uh, that suggests to me that this case is going to survive ESPN's motion for summary judgment. It is going to get to trial, and th- this is on a fast track to trial. In most civil cases, you have somewhat of a relaxed discovery schedule, and in particular in this case, Schefter and ESPN and even JPP ask the court for almost a you know, year and a half, two year, you know, casual stroll through discovery. And the judge said, no, no, no. She put everything on a, on a rocket docket. Discovery is going to be complete within the next couple of months. And the case is set for trial in six months. That will put pressure on the parties uh, to reach an accord on a final number. And in fact, there was a mediation uh, held on Friday in Miami, and and that was significant to me because the deadline for conducting mediation under the court schedule was in April. So I found it very notable that the parties agreed to mediate three months early. So I think there's a desire on both sides to try to make a deal here. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Just read the tea leaves through that mediation, and I'm sure you know, like things we talked about last year in the Rose case too. JPP doesn't want to drag this thing into training camp. He would have to potentially miss part of training camp, doesn't want to be a distraction. Uh, there's no real benefit for him taking this to trial if he doesn't have to. But yeah. obviously, you, they still have to come to an agreement. And can you see Adam Schefter be, not being on Twitter for a day? I mean, that's really the that, that's the ultimate price that's going to be paid in this case uh, for every day that Adam Schefter has to give a deposition or appear in court as a defendant. Uh, that that's that that's that's like his career. I mean, he breaks stories and smack in the middle of training camp having a trial would be anathema to what this guy does for a living. And I think the final number, of course, is going to be subjected to a confidentiality agreement. We're never going to it's never going to be reported. But if, but if it were to be leaked out, I think. Think the uh, I think the strike price here is you know somewhere around eight to ten million dollars. 
Right. So you don't think his lawyers are going to let him live tweet from the courthouse? I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> well, Judge Federico Marino, the chief judge of the Southern District of Florida, does allow uh, cell phones in the courtroom. So uh, live tweeting can be it's done. It's a possibility. The there, you yep. there you go. There you go. Uh, all right, well, let's move on to the NBA. I think we've now spent 40 minutes on the NFL stuff. <laughs> to surprise of none, probably, but... I think that the you know the the NBA and probably the MLB as well have, have fewer issues um, in part because during the last year you know we had new collective bargaining agreements in both sports um, you know there's obviously a bunch of details in both those CBAs that we don't know about yet or we don't know the extent of yet maybe a better way to phrase it so uh, what cases or what issues are you guys looking at for 2017 in the NBA? Well, it's it's not a case, but I was pretty. Um, I don't know. I don't know the word surprise, but it was intriguing to me that the NBA allowed the one and done to survive in this new uh, CBA and uh, ran away with it, or to modify it in a way that would, um, I guess, protect college basketball even more. Be making more than one and making it two and done or creating some situation that was closer to what existed before one and done. And for me, that showed uh, that the NBA is really invested in its developmental league and is and that the the league itself is currently happy with the way things are right now. Yeah, I think there was just probably um, not a whole lot of middle ground in the PA's position and the league's position. You know, the league wants two years. They've been on record of saying that mm-hmm. the PA doesn't want any rule. They want them to be free to choose, you know, out of high school, after a first year, after a second year, whatever you want to do. And so my opinion on this is that they ultimately said, let's not make this a, a deal that's going to mess this thing up, right? Mm-hmm. Let's push it out. They came out and said that they're going to revisit this issue later on, which whatever. I don't think that that really yeah. has a lot of teeth to it because there's no, you know, there's no deadline. There's no no reason for them to come to some sort of agreement unless somehow they could come up with one that is mutually beneficial to both parties. And I would suggest people, I actually wrote a proposal on the sports illustrated, the cauldrons about a proposed one and done rule that mimics uh, sort of baseball's rule and a few other elements. And I think that actually is um, a decent middle ground, but I, you know, I haven't seen something like that floated around um, in formal negotiations. So I, you know, I just think that this is something that they just punted on and said, well, we don't agree with each other. You know, we don't think there's a, a middle ground that we can find. So let's just not let it ruin the negotiations. Yeah, the, the league obviously doesn't feel so strong in its push for two and done that it's willing to compromise the uh, reaching agreement on a, on a bigger deal. So yeah, they punted. Yep. Yeah, I mean, most of the, uh, you know, most of the cases, if you go outside the collective bargaining agreement, unlike the NFL, uh, the, N- uh, the NBA uh, is pretty much uh, uh, you know, a non- ha- has been non-litigious over the course of the last few years. They are rarely sued or they rarely do the suing. Many of the, the cases that Dan identified are individual player, uh, you know, civil suits. Uh, you, you know, so that so so the NBA, uh, I don't think is going to be a, a prominent player on the sports law scene in 2017, except insofar as the debate surrounding sports gambling becomes to, becomes to it begins to crystallize yeah. because they are the, you know, one of the lead plaintiffs in that case and are uh, probably the most visible sports league on the issue of the future of regulated sports gambling. So that's really we're going to talk about that later in the podcast, but. As far as the NBA is concerned, uh, that is that is really the biggest legal issue in 2017 that potentially looms over the entire league and its and its business structure. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know, it's just going back to the collective bargaining agreement, one of the other issues that I'm looking forward to <laughs> is the, they're come bringing in a domestic violence policy. So. You know, we talked already, but we don't have to go into great depth about this. We don't know what's included in it. They haven't had one formally before, but, um, you know, Ezekiel Elliott issue going on in the NFL. NFL has a policy. MLB has a new policy, which is being edited. So this is the first time we're going to see what the NBA will do. NBA is sort of known to being forward-thinking in, in many of these issues. So that's something that I'm excited to see 
see how they're going to approach the issue moving forward and then, you know, see if it's tested moving forward. Um, you know, we saw the first year that the Major League Baseball's domestic violence policy came out, there was what, four cases during the year where there was uh, investigations, three of them ended up in suspensions, um, it, which was very interesting to follow. So um, that's something I'm keeping my eye on, as well as this sort of underdog case with Tom Benson, who, which has been reported oh. to be settled on, I think, three different occasions, but is definitely not settled at this point. And the parties are gearing up for trial, which is in like two weeks, February 6th. And they're, they're, you know, putting hundred hundreds of pages of filings into the court docket, preparing for trial, preparing witness statements. Um, by all means, this thing may not be settled. And, and the case revolves around, um, you know, who will uh, be able to run the Saints and the Pelicans um, af after Tom Benson passes that along. So uh, I think that's just interesting one to keep an eye on. Did you guys have anything else? Uh, I, as someone who was a uh, practicing lawyer in Louisiana is my, um, I guess you could say my parent jurisdiction. I, I'm also watching this Tom Benson's estate case very closely. And, you know, Louisiana has a very unique trust in estates law because it's grounded in the Louisiana code, which, you know, is very French influenced. And it's it's a very good process. It's a is is a very great intestate in particular. But w here we're dealing with a testate issue, a, a will issue before there's even someone who's passed because we're dealing with this competency and and uh, I guess you could say some sort of un alleged undue influence from the from the spouse. It's it's very ugly and very controversial and. We'll see if a settlement was reached, but it could affect ownership of two different franchises. So it's something to keep an eye on. Yeah, I mean, in, uh, New Orleans is such an underrated sports law uh, city. It has, uh, you know, earned, deserved uh, acclaim because of the fantastic Tulane, you know, law school sports law program. But some of the biggest cases uh, that we've been tracking in the sports law uh, genre, you know, Cardell Hayes, uh, you know, the Ronald Gasser, um, Joe McKnight, um, you know, homicide and Tom Benson. I mean, this is really becoming uh, sort of a sports law central in recent months. And of course, one of the biggest issues of all was the uh, relo the NBA's relocation of the 2017 All Star Game uh, from North Carolina to New Orleans as a um, as a reaction and a response uh, to to these LGBT you know same sex bathroom laws, which have only begun to intensify in the re in recent months. I think there are as many as eight or nine state bills that have uh, emerged to, you know, kind of replicate what, what North Carolina was trying to do. So I think we're going to run out of jurisdictions in which to move all-star games and conference championships. <laughs> and under a, <laughs> under a Trump administration and a more, uh, you know, Republic, Republican-controlled state house and Congress, I think we're going to start seeing more of these bills rather than fewer of them. And uh, the sports industry's response to them is going to be very noteworthy to watch in 2017 and beyond. That's a very great, that's a great point, Daniel. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, moving along to the MLB now, I think we've touched on most of what's going on in the NBA. I, I, to me, there's not really that much on the radar. Obviously, that could change at any point. But, you know, the one, I guess there's two lawsuits out there, but one main one uh, that we talked about a little bit with Nathaniel Groh, another UGA professor, a couple of weeks ago, was these uh, minor league lawsuits. And I think... You know, we talked to him about the potential, you know, they, they have an uphill battle. There's a lot of hurdles to go. Uh, you know, frankly, I don't think people are too optimistic that they'll, they'll end up succeeding. But at the same time, that has the potential to change the business of baseball, the way that the minor leagues are run, you know, the amount of organizations underneath them. So to me, uh, the, the SETI v. MLB case is one that sticks out among the others in the MLB category. What do you guys think? I mean, you know, minor league baseball players have long uh, labored under, uh, you know, just these onerous uh, compensation conditions. They're, they're sim similar to college athletes. College athletes yeah. aren't allowed any payment. Well, man minor league baseball players, which is a professional vocation, they're not much further ahead financially. They, 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 they ply their trade at less than what, you know, it's when the dust settles at less than the minimum wage. And the courts have been inhospitable to the argument that, 
Major League Baseball's, uh, you know, you know, practices violate the Fair uh, Labor Standards Act. And I think we, you know, I, I think ultimately one case is going to break through. I just don't know if it's going to be the Senny case uh, because the judge has. Um, denied the motion for class certification, which is central to the case and is only amenable potentially to having a narrow uh, class of plaintiffs. And I'm surprised that in this year, uh, that this time in our, in, in our evolution of, of the growth of athletes' rights, that we're still in a, uh, you know, kind of the indentured servitude, you know, plantation setting under which college athletes and minor league baseball players uh, operate. It's, it, it's, it's an anachronism that these players are being paid the de minimis wages that they're earning uh, essentially to apply their trade and to, and to operate in a career setting. Uh, that this is the, that I don't know if the Senny case is going to be the one that breaks the camel's back, but it's going to be another case. This uh, exemption that baseball operates under for seasonal and recreational amusements, it is an anachronism in real life. It is an anachronism in reality, and at some point a court will revisit this. Uh, I'm just not sure if this is this case is the right case and the right circuit. I agree. I think if anything, Cindy could be the um, the case that kind of leads to the next case, and where you know, and and gives kind of like a roadmap for the next set of plaintiffs in in attacking this this uh, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, indentured servitude type situation. Yeah, anything else in the MLB category that struck your guys' eye? I'm always hoping that once and for all we'll do away with uh, uh, baseball's antitrust exemption. So I'm watching Miranda versus MLB, but, you know, uh, I I don't have a lot of hope that that's what will happen. What's the potential for that case? Will, uh, you know, it's currently before the Ninth Circuit. Is, it, is there a possibility that this case could get to the Supreme Court and we could have the Supreme Court reviewing uh, whether the antitrust exemption uh, is applied or maybe rolling it back? Is this, does it, is this case the right vehicle for that? You know, um, yeah, I, I don't even know if the – if we're even – if it's a matter of whether this case is the right vehicle or, or if it's a matter of whether the Ninth Circuit is ready to be the the vehicle itself for doing away with baseball's antitrust exemption, you know, whether the night if there's any circuit in the United States that's uh, willing to kind of take on such a position, you'd think it would be the Ninth. But for whatever reason, even the Ninth Circuit has been less willing to to do away with the, the exemption. And, and I'm. I'm just not hopeful that it's possible at this point. But wasn't wasn't there another case a year ago, a year or two yeah. ago, City of San Jose? San Jose, same circuit. Okay, so, so are they? Uh, uh, is this stare decisis? And and uh, you know, it's it's it, the expectation would be that the Ninth Circuit in the Miranda case would follow uh, the precedent of the you know City of San Jose case, or are they different antitrust issues? I think it's more. It's not following San Jose as much as it's following uh, the Supreme Court and Federal Baseball Club. And if they deviate and from fo- Federal Baseball Club, the, 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 that increases the likelihood potentially of a cert grant, and we could revisit this at the Supreme Court in two years. Uh, oh, if if they deviate from you know from Federal Baseball Club, then we definitely would would have a, a strong case for certiorari because baseball is definitely yeah. going to request it and. And I think the Supreme Court would grant it. Oh, that would be exciting. That would be exciting. So that's why I'm that's why I'm keeping an eye out on Miranda. I I I think it's a long shot, um, but uh, you know, there's always hope. Yeah, always hope. The Miranda warning. <laughs> there you go. The Miranda <laughs> warning in sports law. Keep track of that case. It could be the vehicle. Uh, through which baseball's antitrust exemption can be revisited uh, you know, two years from now. So, and then uh, law students would have to study two cases with Miranda in the title. Right. So, I think the NCAA is filled with fascinating issues moving forward, and I think the best place to start is probably uh, the Jenkins case. Uh, I don't know mm-hmm. if you guys agree, but that's a blockbuster moving forward. Um, obviously, led by. Um, Tom Brady's lawyer, we'll call him Jeffrey Kessler, a uh, famous litigator in New York. Yes. Um, it was interesting. Um, 
the Law and Sport website asked a bunch of people, um, including myself, you know, what what do you think uh, is going to be the most important sports law issue in 2017? And they asked Jeffrey Kessler the same question, and Kessler said that this case in particular was going to be the most interesting case. Now, he might be biased. Obviously, he's the attorney oh. of record. Um, it's an issue near and dear to him, but he's he's also involved in a number of other cases we're going to be talking about. And, and so for him to say that, I think, really means that he thinks that he has a strong case here. Uh, and for those who don't know, the, you know, the Jenkins case is sort of a follow-up, in a sense, to the O'Bannon litigation, which uh, we found that the NCAA was in violation of an antitrust violation, but ultimately the result of that was relatively minor. Yeah. However, the Jenkins plaintiffs are seeking uh, basically a free market, in other words, a free agency for college players and, and colleges to pay players to attend, uh, which would be a complete game-changer as far as uh, you know the way that college sports particularly you know college football and college men's basketball the revenue sports i'll call them the way that those operate um so what do you guys think about jenkins you think i mean obviously so another thing about jenkins is that you know we probably won't go to trial until 2018 it's certain to go through the appeal process i think one way or the other um so it's a it's a ways off it's not something that's going to happen this year but um you know, one of the big notes that I had was the developments in the Jenkins case moving forward. What do you guys think? Well, Dan, uh, Dan, I agree with you. And where maybe it would be an 18 or 19 trial, uh, it's going to have a summary judgment motion is going to be heard in, in this year. So if uh, Jenkins can survive that very big hurdle, that's when we're all going to, to definitely get excited and, and see what happens. And they're in the right circuit. Kessler brought this within the right circuit following O'Bannon's heels. And I think it's a good dovetail from the from the uh, discussion on um, baseball's antitrust exemption because, in a sense, um, the Ninth Circuit, while not recognizing the quasi-exemption that the Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, and Third Circuits have found for uh, college football, for its, for its rules that touch on amateurism, something that I call the or something the Seventh Circuit and others call the pro-competitive presumption of validity that stems from Justice uh, Stevens Ditka and Board of Regents. Um, it, it's it's kind of created this this is fortified the NCAA's rules based on this premise that consumers value amateurism, that consumers will stop watching college athletics if college athletes are paid more than educational expenses. And the, you know, there's just no basis for yeah, that. It's so um, bogus. And now, keep in mind, antitrust is a consumer welfare provision. So, if consumers aren't harmed by the NCA paying athletes, then there should be no protection for the NCA's uh, education for its its clear violation of the antitrust laws with this very uh, anti-competitive behavior. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I'm kind of interested or intrigued by the recent movement among college athletic directors to form a political action committee uh, to try to accomplish um, legislatively behind closed doors and through lobbying efforts, uh, you know, um, you know, you know, a, a result that could counteract any outcomes in Kessler or Alston or any of these other employee or, or you know amateurism cases. So I, I think in 2017, with uh, you know a Republican controlled Congress with pre with President Trump in office, I think the influence of the athletic directors who have a lot to lose here. I mean, they are a highly compensated group of people. Uh, you know, so many of them earn in excess of half a million dollars a year that they're working behind the scenes to um, counteract any uh, progress that's achieved by the athletes in the courts. And that's going to be something to watch or at least look look for in you know sort of on parallel tracks. Uh, that 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 whatever gains are achieved in the courts, uh, you know, might be limited uh, by either an antitrust exemption or some other uh, measure adopted by this Congress. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think all of that going on at the same time uh, is interesting. It'll just be interesting to see the pressure that the litigation places on all of these parties. 
you know, I think we saw that in O'Bannon when um, even before the judge ruled it, they, the universities upped their cost to a cost of attendance scholarship. They mm-hmm. gave the player more players more money. Uh, and I don't think that probably would have happened without the pressure of litigation looming and, and putting it in the news all the time and really sort of getting people to talk about this discussion of and, student athletes being treated unfairly compared to the universities that are making tons of money and the coaches that are getting paid tons of money and, and everything else that goes along with that. And Dan, you, you brought that up, the, the cost of attendance uh, increases that happened um, in, in relation to O'Bannon. And before that, white versus NCA. You know, I've got a study right now I'm doing with uh, noted economist, uh, notable economist uh, Nick Watanabe, where we actually investigated consumer reaction to the cost of attendance adjustment. And spoiler alert, um, there was no negative influence on consumer behavior. And keep this in mind, the cost of attendance stipends that are now provided to athletes, these are not direct educational expenses. The cost of attendance is a formula designed to cover, kind of fill the gap that's left between, um, you know, tuition fees and books and room and board and what you need to be a student with at a, at a particular institution. And so what we're doing now is we're paying these athletes small subs on what if they can use money for laundry and paper and and uh, scantrons, or they can use this money on Beats by Dre or uh, or video games. You know, it's discretionary spending, and yet we've seen no influence on consumer behavior. And if we, if we're going to allow small sums, then why not larger sums? It shows that consumers really really don't care. Yeah, that's really interesting. I never bought that argument that consumers care. I mean, it's not like once these players turn pro people quit watching the NFL. Um, it just never really made sense to me. And I, I think maybe it may alienate a very small sect of fans that are really um, into the NCAA's version of amateurism or whatever you want to call it. But uh, you know, I, I think that over a relatively short period of time, people would get over that and just understand the, um, commercial value of, of what these student athletes are providing. Uh, but, you know, I think it's, it's a pretty heated topic. Uh, I was on a panel in Las Vegas a few months ago with uh, a general counsel of a major conference, a athletic director from a SEC team, and another private lawyer who were all on that side of the fence. And I was trying to argue in favor of players' rights and just got attacked. And I think it just shows you that, um, you know, a lot of the people that are in those positions are in favor of status quo and are really not willing to take a deep look outside of what the NCAA is preaching right now. So it probably will take something like litigation, like we're seeing to really force significant change moving forward. Or it could take a action by the by the athletes themselves. Yep, that's a great point. Look at what happened at Missouri. I mean, 30 football players brought down the president of the University of Missouri. Now imagine if all SEC football players just for one game maybe announced the week of the game that they're, they're not going to play. Imagine what that would result in. That alone would probably bring about significant change, you know? Yep. Especially if it was the, you know, national championship game. What if both teams just said we're not going to play, you know? Um, they, they have a lot of power. and it, It's, you know, it's a huge ask of those players, obviously. and um, it, It's tough to kind of pin that on 19, 20, 21-year-old kids, really. But at the same time, it, it's definitely a possibility. We've seen it. So uh, what other NCAA stuff are you guys interested in? I had Baylor, Mark. We don't have to talk about Baylor if we don't want to. No. Uh, the, uh, da- the Dawson case. I, I mean, the, uh, you know, the recent Berger decision from the Seventh Circuit had a very interesting concurring opinion uh, that while the uh, efforts by the track and field athletes to have their status characterized as employees was rejected uh, by the Seventh Circuit, the concurring opinion uh, distinguished that case and wondered 
how it should be treated if we're dealing with scholarship athletes in revenue producing sports mm -hmm. and and that uh and, and that segues neatly into the uh, Dawson versus NCAA case that was filed um, you know, last year in the Northern District of California, and that is set to be uh, argued on a motion to dismiss filed by the NCAA uh, later in the month of February. And it will be interesting to see to what extent, if any, uh, the Northern District follows the Seventh Circuit precedent. And this case has the potential of, of being a runaway case and deviating uh, from Berger based upon the uh, bright line between non-scholarship, non-revenue producing sports and, you know, big time college sports, that this could be the first case uh, or first decision that recognizes scholarship athletes as employees given all the training, all the year-round work that they put into it and the economic reality of the NCAA business model and the, the new stadia, the coaching salaries, the AD salaries, the money that surrounds every aspect of big-time college football and big-time big uh, college basketball that filters down to everybody except one group, and that's the athletes. And this case has the potential uh, to be a path-breaking decision, given the different footing um, of, of Dawson as a you know former Division One uh, scholarship player. So th this 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 could be a, a major uh, decision in 2017 or early 2018. It has that potential. And, and Daniel's right for all those reasons, and it's a great case. It's one I'm watching for exactly the reasons he mentioned. The only thing that makes me a little skeptical in regards to how the Ninth Circuit is going to handle this is that in O'Bannon, they were very careful not to recognize the student athletes as employees. And in fact, when looking at and finding a relevant market, they can actually actually the buyers within that market rather than necessary inputs to make the product uh, itself. So in this sense, you know, there seems to be some very careful navigation by the Ninth Circuit to make sure that it didn't recognize them as employees in O'Bannon. So it makes me a little um, uh makes me a little less inclined to think they're they're willing to do so in this instance, but I'm hopeful for the reasons well, that Daniel mentioned that they might be. Um, yeah, but, it, you know, tab three, aren't the um, legal underpinnings of the two cases somewhat different? We're, we're, we're looking at in the case of O'Bannon, an antitrust analysis, and in mm -hmm. um, the Dawson case, an economic reality analysis under the Fair Labor Standards yeah. Act, uh, which is this multi-tiered, you know, look at various different factors that focuses on the economic reality rather than the notion of amateurism. I mean, there is obviously an overlap and, and a relationship between the two analyses somewhat. Uh, but I'm not, you know, I, I haven't studied uh, the distinctions in the two cases closely enough, but I, I, I would think that the court can justify characterizing the employees, characterizing the athletes as employees in, in, in Dawson without running afoul of O'Bannon based on a, on a pure FLSA economic reality analysis. Oh, oh, absolutely they could. And I, I, I don't mean to say that. What I'm just saying is that in O'Bannon, they were careful not okay. to run afoul of the NCAA's classification that they're not employees. Okay. Because, you know, uh, in Tanaka, which was an antitrust action that w was at the district court level within, within um, the Ninth Circuit, there was this kind of uh, recognition of, of uh, football players, Division I football players, as necessary inputs. And there was this thinking that maybe within the Ninth Circuit we could find them to be employees. And yet in O'Bannon, they were very careful not to touch that. So that is why I'm skeptical. But yes, in this case, in Dawson, it forces the issue on the Ninth Circuit. For that reason, I think there is a chance based on uh, based on what you mentioned. But you know, it's it would it would be a groundbreaking decision, and it would revolutionize college. College athletics. Would, would, would schools drop drop the sports? I mean, would would only big no. time programs be able to sustain uh, paying a minimum wage to their their scholarship athletes? First, first off, Daniel, this we're t we're talking about a multi billion dollar industry. These things don't just go away overnight. Mm -hmm. As long as there's consumer demand for it, I, I I am not one of these fear mongers who thinks that if we start rethinking how college athletics operates that'll just go away 
I think what you would see is a a force, a movement toward recognizing um, athletes as labor and allowing them to unionize, allowing them to be represented in some form of collective bargaining. And I know that it would be very difficult to do that with so many state institutions and state laws mm-hmm. that prohibit unions and and, and, and and state employees. But if where there's a will, there's a way. And, and you know, one of the big ironies of this whole situation is if they were treated as employees and they did collectively bargain with the NCAA, their leverage would be so weak because, you know, I mean, that it's three to four years, you know, is what we're talking about. So strike use of economic weapons like strikes are, 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 are going to be hard to, to sell for athletes to, to, to take that position. And, you know, with such weak leverage, you know, if there was collective bargaining, the NCAA would be able to impose some a pretty strict salary cap on 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 these athletes, and may be able to to receive. And if there was collective bargaining, they would receive protection in antitrust, and they would not have these problems. And and it would be a way for the NCAA to get pretty much what it wants, but at least let the athletes have some fun in the process. Yeah, really, really good point. It's a fascinating conundrum. I mean, it's hard to even imagine the NCAA with the unions involved. Um, it, it certainly would turn it into something much more like professional sports, uh, not only in the way that uh, the payments paying players, but also in the way that these things are negotiated and then, you know, yeah. how we look at the rules of the game and, and things like that. So I think it's a really fascinating point, And I, I, I can't wait to see what the NCAA looks like 10 years from now because it's certainly going to be different one way or the other, is my hopefully, opinion. Hope, hopefully Warren Zola's and Gabe Feldman's you know, vision will, uh, will come to pass, but it certainly seems to be moving in a positive direction, although at a glacial speed for athletes. And, and a decade from now, uh, I think much of what they're fighting for today will come to pass, but it's just, uh, you know, the, the, the pain and the process of getting there is going to be laborious and time consuming. It may not be much help to today's athletes and they're fighting the battle, uh, for future generation of, of, of amateur athletes. Yep. Uh, so before we move on from the NCAA, I did want to at least touch on the Baylor stuff. Uh, just, in a sense that there's a lot of it out there. Um, you know, I think the the big thing here, again, and this is kind of like what we saw in, in NFL concussion litigation, is Baylor, you know, really hiding information with the Pepper Hamilton report. They, they hired a law firm to come in, do an internal investigation, and then they released only the highlights, essentially, of that investigation with no names listed, very general descriptions, um, and that though, you know, those general descriptions were very damning, but at the same time, we don't know the underlying details of, of what exactly happened and how this is, is structured is they're saying that there's no official report from Pepper Hamilton, the law firm, but at the same time, there's clearly all this underlying, uh, documents, interviews, um, that the law firm and the university have. Uh, that tells the full story, but to this point we haven't, you know, litigation hasn't been able to uncover that information. And I think obviously Baylor is going to try to shield that information using the attorney client privilege. And I I think it's an intriguing storyline to follow to see if any of these, you know, there's four title nine lawsuits filed against the school that our Bryles filed a lawsuit against, the uh, Board of Regents at Baylor. There's other lawsuits, other legal action, actions happening, and it'll just be interesting to see if Baylor can shield itself from releasing all this potentially extremely damaging information. And that may come down to whether they're willing to pay off all of these opposing parties through litigation or not. It's, uh, you know, I don't, I think that most of the headlines bad things happening to Baylor came out last year, but the legal actions will certainly be a major issue moving into 2017. So with that, I mean, I think we can kind of move on to my, my catch all category and I'm going to give Dan Wallach two minutes and I'm timing you to tell us about why sports betting is going to be uh, one of the major stories of 2017. 
Okay. Uh, in a nutshell, the U.S. Supreme Court will, uh, you know, is is inching closer to granting certiorari uh, to the New Jersey uh, parties in the sports betting case. What happened this week at the High Court uh, was on the on on Tuesday, the Supreme Court issued its orders on a list of different cases. It had conferenced on Friday, uh, January, um, I forget which, January thirteenth. And the Supreme Court called for the views of the Solicitor General, which was an interesting uh, wild card here, because instead of granting cert or denying cert, it called for the uh, the SG's opinion. And that's notable because the Solicitor General will be appointed by Donald Trump, who is a major proponent of sports betting uh, and has been uh, going back to the early 90s when he owned casinos. And the correlation between a Solicitor General's opinion and a cert grant is between 80 and 100 percent, meaning – if the Solicitor General uh, recommends that cert be granted, in all likelihood, cert will be granted. Let's look at how the SG's office is emerging now since Trump was elected. He appointed a deputy uh, a Solicitor General a couple of days ago. It doesn't have to be confirmed that is a major uh, proponent of states' rights and limited interference – uh, with interstate commerce, and it is looking, he is shaping the Solicitor General's office in such a way that I would expect the Solicitor General to recommend that certiorari be granted when it files its, S, when it files its amicus curiae brief in May. And if that happens, before the end of June, the Supreme Court will likely grant certiorari, and we could be headed towards oral argument before the U.S. Supreme Court later this year during the fall 2017, you know, 2018 term. And at the same time, uh, there is movement afoot in state houses across the country, New York, South Carolina, and potentially Mississippi. So the, the issue over PASPA's constitutionality could be playing out before the Supreme Court later this year or potentially the lower federal courts as soon as this summer. So uh, the litigation surrounding PASPA will continue no matter what, and all these activities could act as a catalyst for congressional action sooner rather than later. And I, I believe that within the next two to three years, Congress will be, tr- will be attacking the issue of how to regulate and legalize sports betting and possibly folding in online gambling and fantasy sports within that. So this is, this is happening and will be a very dynamic period going forward. So what's the fastest route to legalize sports betting at this point? Judicial fiat. Meaning Congress is going to take forever, right? Congress is going to have hearings. You're going to have pushback. You're going to have lobbyists. There's no lobbying at the Supreme Court. There's simply briefs, oral argument, decision. And the greatest thing about a Supreme Court decision is finality. There is no Supreme Court of Mars, to my knowledge. And if the Supreme Court declares that PASPA is unconstitutional, which is a plausible outcome. That would be what, uh, spring, early spring, spring next year? Uh, winter, yeah. uh, or January through you know spring of 2018, it will set off a gold rush among states to legalize sports betting. I mean, if you, if you remove PASPA from the equation, which PASPA is the federal law that prohibits states from sanctioning sports gambling, you take that away because it's unconstitutional, you're going to see a spate of state sports betting bills introduced. We're seeing it now. But if the Supreme Court declares it unconstitutional, we could have as many as a, a, a dozen or more states uh, bringing legal and regulated sports gambling within their borders uh, before the end of next year. So the fastest way is undoubtedly the litigation route because it, move, it, it doesn't move at as glacial a speed as the whims of politics. Yeah. This is simply – it rises or falls on the merits of the argument and there could be finality within a year. Yeah. Well, Daniel. A little bit. Yeah. It does move pretty slow because uh, these Christie cases have been in the courts for, what, five or six years now? But I, your point is well taken. Tab three, yeah. what do you got? I was going to ask Daniel because, you know, he is the guy on this subject. So um, if you were to put your finger on the pulse of the Supreme Court right now with its, you know, very divided, you know, 4-4, four, four, what, would, what, would what would be your prediction if this – current court were to decide issue, let's say, this week. How do you think they go? Uh, it would probably be a 4 for split, and the Third Circuit's decision uh, would, would be intact, and PASPA would remain as an impediment to state lawmakers. But the beauty 
And the reality of this um, situation is that it will not be an eight-judge court that either hears the case on the merits or even grants or denies certiorari. There will be a ninth justice uh, named sometime soon enough. And there is sufficient time between now and when the Solicitor General is expected to file his brief, which should be maybe in May, it should be several months, there will be a ninth justice on the court by the time the Supreme Court goes thumbs or down at the cert stage, and a ninth justice obviously by the time it would consider the merits of the case down the road. And I think, uh, I think given the current political climate and the ideological um, you, you know, underpinning to who, whichever, whoever is appointed to the court, he's going to be conservative. He's going to be a state's rights uh, advocate. He's going to be somebody with the backing of the Federalist Society that that is probably a reliable vote in favor of cert and probably a vote in favor of finding passive to be unconstitutional as a, a, an impermissible uh, interference with state sovereignty under the 10th Amendment. So it's going to be a close vote. I don't see this as being 9-0 either way. It's going to you know be a 5-4, 6-3 uh, potentially. But I think the wild card here isn't only the constitutional issue, but the uh, emergence of daily fantasy sports as another form of gambling, which violates the federal law, but goes unenforced by the federal government and by the uh, professional sports leagues. So the two issues are, um, are you know, are, you know, may resonate with the court. And I, I would expect, if I were to put my money on the outcome. I think the statute is going to be declared unconstitutional and the floodgates are going to open. The status quo doesn't make any that? sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can bet on the sports betting case. Right. The statute is an anachronism. It doesn't work, and it has constitutional infirmities to boot, both for the preferential treatment given to DFS and the preferential treatment given to Nevada and the state, the tension between federal interference and state autonomy. And uh, if I were to bet, uh, if the, the Donald Trump has the unique capability here to influence the granting of cert and ultimately to tip the scales in favor of New Jersey with the appointment of that ninth justice that would uh, recognize or, or elevate New Jersey's position over the status quo. So I, I, I would be willing, if someone were, giving, were to give me good odds, uh, I would put my money down on a cert grant and a reversal. Interesting. Yeah, I, mean, I think for those who want to even dive deeper into that, we, Dan and I did a short pod this week uh, after the Supreme Court's decision to ask the Solicitor General for their input. So I'd tune into that. But for now, I think we can... Uh, moving along, I'm sure we'll have more coverage of that as Dan is the, uh, I think, the nation's leading expert in the sports gambling issue. Obviously, he knows just, just a little bit about it. So, um, Just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, th- thanks for saying that. I'm very passionate about the subject. I've been proven right more than I've been proven wrong. And my, uh, my instinct tells me that this is lining up for a very favorable Solicitor General's amicus curiae brief. Let's hope so. Just from a a sports law coverage point, that would be a very uh, exciting Supreme Court oral argument and decision, obviously. I mean, it's going to be the only case, the only sports law case that has Supreme Court legs in 2018. And if they lined up around the block for the slants, uh, you're going to have to get to the Supreme Court building at like 4 a.m., the night before just to save a spot in that in that small courtroom. Yep. So another in our other category that I thought's really interesting case from last year that uh, one of I think one of my favorite sports law cases definitely didn't get the ink that a lot of others did. But it's the uh, NHL Dennis Weidman uh, situation. You know, we had player discipline. We have a concussion. We have a referee involved. Uh, the the case is fully briefed for summary judgment, which is going to decide the whole case uh, in September. And now the judge is just sitting on it. Um, so that, that decision could come any day. Uh, I think that's a little bit of old news, but I, I am interested to hear how that one goes and whether or not that decision will be appealed, which um, could bring in sort of these uh, commissioner powers aspects from the NFL and other sports as well. Um and then for me and on the other, unless you guys have any take on that case, feel free. 
But uh, the other issue moving forward is the the U.S. women's national soccer team's uh, continued fight for um, equal pay in their sport. Uh, you know, we saw major fights last year, the filing of a federal lawsuit, EEOC complaint, a threat of a strike at the World Cup, which ulti- or excuse me, the Olympics, which ultimately did not come to fruition. Um, there seems to be a little bit of unrest right now. They they file they fired their counsel, the the players union did, and um, right before the the CBA technically expired, although the, although the CBA uh, continues to run on now past its expiration because neither side filed a formal opt out, which I believe is a sixty day opt out. I can't remember off the top of my head, but. They would have to file that and then yeah. wait for that to get over, and then it would officially expire. Um, so I right now they have, weeks. right now they have no union head. There's a, a, a EOC complaint that's out there. We don't really have a very clear deadline on that, but uh, it's something that'll probably happen this year. Uh, it, it's kind of unclear how how much Jeffrey Kessler is still involved with this group or not. He represented them throughout this past year, but. You know, them signaling a change with their representation may mean that he may not be as involved or involved at all moving forward. Um, so that's one that I think is, is still very uh, a hot issue moving forward. Um, I think it, it, it uh, last year when it came into the news, it really um, brought up a lot of interesting points about, you know, a women's sport that is more popular than a men's sport. And I yeah. think that's a really interesting dynamic. Uh, you don't see that in, in some of the other major sports moving forward. So we'll, we'll be, we'll see. Yeah. Dan, the wide, think, hit, yeah, go ahead, Tom. Oh, I was just going to say, and that's, that's the main point that interests me is the fact that the, the women's national team are more successful than the men's national team. And there's such strong consumer demand for, for what they're producing. I, I just, I don't understand why we're even debating this pay the women what they deserve. Come on. Get this out of court. Yeah. Hmm. Well, it's not your money that's paying them. I think, you know, I think uh, U.S. True. soccer, uh, I mean, U.S. soccer has come out. And I think it's so hard to tell with these economists um, one way or the other uh, what's what's true and what's not. Obviously, the national team is arguing that they're paid less and the, the U.S. soccer federations arguing that they're paid actually more than men or equal to men. Um, and it kind of depends on how you – to find pay and other things. So um, getting to the truth of that matter, I think is important moving forward, but, but regardless, you know, they're obviously a very well-known brand. They have very well-known uh, female athletes um, that are very marketable. And, and, you know, anytime you see the union and the organization just fighting like this, it's just not good for anybody. So yeah, let's pay the women. Yeah, um, I want to dial back to the Weidemann case for a second. I think it's particularly noteworthy if the um, Southern District judge sides with the NHL in this case and we could have um, an inconsistency or, or at least a diametrically, diametrically opposite results from Deflategate to the Weidemann case. You know, in the, in the Deflategate case, the NFL argued that the arbitration decision should be accorded tremendous deference and, and the arbitrator's decision is sacrosanct. Uh, it's a it's the flip side in Weidemann. The NHL is challenging the arbitrator's decision as having exceeded his powers. And I'm, it will be fascinating if the league wins the Weidemann case and we have uh, basically opposite results from Deflategate uh, to to Weidemann and how that could potentially play out in a Second Circuit argument. Uh, so that that's that's why Weidemann is a potential wild card for one of the year's most fascinating sports law developments if the NHL is able to buck the odds as Brady did in the lower court and secure a vacating of the arbitration decision. Yeah, definitely. I think <laughs> the NHL's positions on things are – somewhat comical um you know they fired their arbitrator who ruled against them basically uh, just just kind of blatant uh disregard for him and his decision and authority um so definitely interesting case to keep in mind you know also and sh- there's a concussions class action against the nhl which uh revealed thousands of documents this is this is the nfl's fear right 
thousands of documents were released. You know, I was sifting through them, running my preview, and there's just some really terrible emails. Uh, you know, making light of players' injuries and uh, concealing them, concealing diagnoses from the players. Mike Peluso, in particular, was diagnosed as having a concussion, and the New Jersey Devils concealed that from him and sent him out to play again. But sadly and tragically, this issue is getting zero attention from the United States press. If it were not for Rick Westhead uh, in Canada, the issue would be largely have you know be swept under the table. It is you know, maybe because of the lower profile of the National Hockey League. Yeah. It is getting a shocking, uh, shockingly little amount of attention, and it is deserving of even more attention than the NFL lawsuit because that that's pretty much over. And the discovery that has been yielded in the NHL lawsuit has been a treasure trove of embarrassing and just horrible details about. Um, about to the extent to which the NHL is in a state of denial about this. And you have to imagine that that's what that, I mean, at least to a certain extent, and at least some of it, maybe more, who knows, but that's what the NFL is sitting on right now. And mm. uh, so I think it, it provides a pretty good example and a pretty good reason for why, you know, if this blows up in the NFL the same way that it played out in the NHL, the blowback is going to be massive, right? Um, so, because the NFL obviously has a, a much higher profile, in my opinion, and why the NHL uh, stuff hasn't blown up more is, is what you mentioned, Dan. It just they're able to keep it under the radar. I think there's a there's an active hockey audience and hockey fans that know about it, but um, it certainly hasn't sort of reached the national audience like what happened in a matter of seconds, minutes um, in the NFL. Agreed, agreed. And I think once the class in the NHL lawsuit gets certified, if it does get certified, I, I, I believe that as it gets closer to trial, it could be a compelling uh, trial, a compelling litigation, and more will come out on summary judgment. We've just seen only a select sample of the emails and the discovery that was used to support a motion for class certification. When it, if and when it gets to a motion for summary judgment, uh, it, it can, it can, you know, it, it, it could get much worse, and we will be seeing, uh, you know, worse um, disclosures and testimony, deposition transcript. The fun is about to begin. But the real battleground for the for the plaintiffs here is prevailing on a motion for class certification. And this judge, uh, I think it's Susan Rogers Nelson, has been uh, issuing some, I guess, early decisions that seem to favor uh, the plaintiff side of it. So I'm hopeful that we get to see the day where all the you know all the details and all the all the you know all, all the private communications and all the bad testimony sees the light of day because that will that could transform this lawsuit and make it uh, one that could uh, bring significant benefits to so many hundreds of former players who are not doing too well. Uh, so uh, hopefully this has the potential of being a, a colossus of a case. Yeah. Did you guys see? All right. I think we made it near the end. Was there any other cases that you guys had? Before we sign off, I mean, I'm we seeing go- shakes. This is an audio podcast, but there's a lot of head <laughs> shaking happening right now through our video. I'm I'm watching to some extent the CrossFit case because it just I find it you know kind of ironic because CrossFit has has you know they're a very litigious organization and they've 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 struck out in a lot of cases trying to get proprietary protections for their collection of exercises in the course tend to say that they're saying you're just putting together exercises that existed before you put them together. And now there's this products liability action against CrossFit or it's, it's like a products liability action, if you will. And, and it's like CrossFit, maybe they back on all those decisions that are like saying, hey, we don't make an actual product that can cause these types of injuries because all we do is put together various types of exercises and you can't sue exercises. So and it's, that's something that's interesting me because it's kind of like CrossFit's in this position. You're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And uh, maybe it gives them an out. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely interested in that lawsuit. I'm glad you brought it up. I thought I was the only one, but uh i'm a i'm a crossfitter myself but i uh recognize that people see it as a cult sometimes uh probably rightfully so um and crossfit has done 
a ton to uh, be litigious in the defense of their brand and uh, what the exercise is, whether that relates to this weird illness that happens to some people when they exercise too hard. I forget what it's called. Do you guys remember know what it's called? No. Uh, but in any event, that's something. But this is, you know, the the one that that I previewed uh, in my article has to do with. It's a really fascinating lawsuit when you dig in. Uh, this research journal apparently, uh, quote unquote, did a study with people who did CrossFit and, and to see whether or not CrossFit causes injuries. And uh, they came to the conclusion that it did. Um, CrossFit dug into that and basically sued them in a false claims action saying that, no, this is wrong. Your data is wrong, which turned out to be true. The, the, the journal was, um, it, it took like 20 participants and the people like didn't actually oh. do CrossFit or didn't report it accurately. Um, and so now, you know, CrossFit's taking this all the way, although they, they're in a very favorable position right now. The judge already ruled the false element in summary judgment and already ruled that this journal was actually wrong and was putting out false information. Now it's just a matter of whether they did so knowingly or not and a few other elements of the claim. So, but that's certainly a, a, you know, a case that's going to go to trial. And I think, uh, you know, seeing how aggressive CrossFit is as a brand is interesting just, just to see how they fall in sort of this fitness marketplace. There's, it's obviously a big name that's out there right now, but there's a lot of competitors, a lot of gyms and companies that do things similarly that, you know, the high intensity interval training route. Um, so CrossFit obviously sees um, itself as having this niche um, that it, it doesn't want to be infringed upon by these other companies, rightfully so. Okay. And, and uh, the, the, only, the other case, the other line of um, cases that I see, uh, becoming important are the realm of online gaming and daily fantasy sports cases. Dan, in your in your Colossus fifty four case preview, you you highlighted one case in particular, which was uh, the lawsuit from a from a group of New York citizens challenging uh, the fantasy sports legislation that was enacted in New York. And New York is so different than many of the other states that have had DFS legislation because uh, the question in New York is whether the legislature is free to even set policy in this area because New York has a constitutional prohibition against gambling and the uh, ability to legalize a form of gambling in New York may require a voter referendum. And that's the issue that's been teed up in Albany County, New York. And that case has the potential for resolution this year, but, but even looking further, it has has a strong potential for disrupting the growth of the fantasy sport, daily fantasy sports industry, at least in New York State, which is the most critical state in the country, right? I mean, New York is the financial you know, center of the United States, but it also is the state with the greatest number of daily fantasy sports entrants. And if the plaintiffs were to prevail in that case, the result would be an injunction rolling back and invalidating the New York interactive fantasy sports law, putting it on a constitutional referendum process, which would take at least two years. So that's a case that I'm watching closely. I'm also following what's going to go on with the Wire Act. And the Wire Act uh, could uh, come back into play in 2017 with a, Attorney General Sessions um, re, uh, rescinding the 2011 interpret, reinterpretation of the Wire Act, which limited its its application solely to sports betting and opened up the, the opened up the path for online poker, online casino games, and even to some degree online fantasy sports. So depending on how AG Sessions reinterprets the Wire Act in his discretion as the Attorney General, that could have repercussions for the growth of online gambling, gambling, the growth of online poker, casino, and maybe even DFS. So I'm watch, I'm looking, I'm going to look at that closely. And this is not a court case. It's simply a uh, interpretive opinion that his office has the authority to issue. And I would expect him to look more closely at the Wire Act in 2008 and 17. Interesting stuff. Um, you know, obviously DFS has been been in the news the last couple of years as well, so uh, hopefully we'll see a resolution this year uh, moving forward in the New York case. Um, so before I let you guys go, uh, Super Bowl team predictions for today. Do you got them? 
I'm going. I'll go first because I put some thought into this. Not really, but uh, I'm going Patriots Packers. All right, I'm in Georgia, and I have to buy. You know, uh, or my students will 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 they'll kill me. Uh, I have to go Falcons. And and I actually think the Falcons have a great offense, so I'm going to go Falcons and stand by that. And you know, Steelers. Going to go opposite me, tab three. See how it That's, is. Yeah. <laughs> Someone has to do it. I'll, I'll give you two predictions, and um, it will be the perfect segue. And teaser for the movie that's going to come out next year called Four Games in Fall, uh, which is a movie uh, based on Deflategate. It is preordained by the gods that Tom Brady will be hoisting the Super Bowl trophy and the Super Bowl MVP award uh, within close proximity to Roger Goodell. The gods have have ordained this to happen. I can't wait for this to happen, by the way. It's going to be amazing. (laughs) Yeah, so uh, it will be the Patriots in this week. It will be the Patriots in the Super Bowl and their opponent. Uh, I I think this is almost a year of destiny for Aaron Rodgers. Uh, He has been the ultimate escape artist and this is his year, and it will be a collision two weeks from now of two teams of destiny, the Green Bay Packers and the New England Patriots. I mean, the, the, the Falcons have made tremendous strides. Matt Ryan has reestablished himself as one of the elite quarterbacks in the NFL, but I'm going to go with the two destiny teams and then with the ultimate, um, the ultimate uh, you know, fantasy for New England Patriots fans, which is Goodell handing the Super Bowl trophy to Robert Kraft. <laughs> With with Tom Brady in the background, I mean that has to happen, and that's I'm going with it both from the heart and just logically. I think these are the two best teams remaining in the tournament. Yeah, and I'll note that we're recording this on uh, Sunday morning, early afternoon. Yeah, you have to get so the- most people will probably listen to this after the games are over. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully, I won't sound like an ass when that happens. Could, but can we edit our? Could we edit our answers later I if we uh, it turns yeah. out we're wrong? <laughs> we can't, but. Um, that's okay. We're okay with being wrong, right, guys? We're, we're sport law experts, not football prognosticators. Right. So, I mean. There you go. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining me, um, especially tab three. Um, definitely give uh, him a follow on Twitter. is a great Twitter follow as well. It's Dr. T-A-B number three. Dr. Tab three. Is that right? Did I get it right? Yeah, that's right. That's okay. my handle. Uh, what what other uh, stuff are you working on these days? You pro- uh, you write so much. Um, yeah, that I'm sure you have something well, coming down the pipeline. Yeah, I'm I'm doing a few projects related to the NCA and this idea of consumer interest in amateurism. So that's it's it's occupying the bulk of my time. I've also I'm working on some trademark uh, stuff, and uh, we just actually started the first sport economic and law lab, uh, which is a co-collaboration between me and a, a scholar in China that uh, we're launching this year. So we're excited about that. And um, and like you, I'm anxiously awaiting what this year in sports law will reveal. I, I would like to say this, you know, a long time, like I said, follower of both of you and the white Bronco and and I always tell my students to follow the both of you and the White Bronco and to listen to this podcast when it's released because I just think what you do within sport law is great and um, is high quality. Thanks, sir. We, uh, we appreciate you. that. We, again, we, paid our, we pay our guests to say that every time. So, uh, But, no, we really appreciate it. And we yeah. appreciate you joining us. And, once again, was a longer podcast than we anticipated for, but – um, I guess there's so much going on out there that we had to do it. So uh, thanks again, and we'll talk to everybody soon. Yeah. Take care. Enjoy the games. Enjoy the games.